Tonight, I just want to complete what I started yesterday. And then tomorrow, I will open a new syllabus. The idea is to equip people, equip God's servants for the assignment of the kingdom. A generation is saddled with a divine responsibility that we must wake up to. Otherwise, the purposes of God will not find expression. I began by telling you that there are two parallel governments on the face of the earth. In John chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible said, The devil cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's a demonic entity with a purpose and an agenda. And the agenda is destruction and death. But Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and life to the full. So God has a purpose on the face of the earth and the devil also has an agenda. It takes more than desire to fulfill God's mandate. You must be trained, you must be equipped to fulfill God's mandate. No matter how passionate you are, if you are not fortified for this assignment, you'll be overwhelmed. And this is why meetings like this are important. It's not a revival meeting necessarily. At some point, there will be impartations, but it's a meeting of instructions. It's a meeting where our understanding is enlightened so that we understand the agenda of God and why we must commit ourselves to fulfilling that agenda. Because this is what gives us relevance as we walk on the face of the earth. Can we celebrate Tyrone? <laughs> the evangelist. <laughs> And can we celebrate my brother Smith? What a blessing. Amazing. Glory to God. Thank you so much, sir, for being a huge blessing. From the first time you ministered at the apostolic invasion, my spirit was lighted. And I know this is a, a blend, pure blend. God bless you. Hallelujah. So we must be trained and equipped for this program, for this agenda, and for this mandate. It's a serious issue. And this is what will give value to our lives and give meaning to our existence. Now, when we started, I told you that there are five major programs that will characterize the last days. And we are in the last days. Joel chapter 2, from verse 28 to verse 32. The Bible makes us understand in the last days, he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And in Acts chapter 2, we saw... When the outpouring took place, Peter referenced Joel. So Peter affirmed that we are in the last days. And I told you that there are five major programs that will define the last days. And the first is what the Bible calls the great falling away. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 3, Paul was beseeching us as the people of God. He said, on the strength of the appearing of Jesus and our gathering together to him. So he was talking to us on the strength of the rapture, the coming of Jesus. There's an authority that he confers when a man realizes that this life will come to an end and will be summoned to the yonder places. There is an urgency puts on you. And so Paul is saying on the strength of that urgency, he is drawing the attention of the church to something that is a must. And he went further to say, let no man deceive you. He said, the Lord will not come until there is first of all a falling away. And Jesus himself corroborated that emphasis in Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. No, verse 12. He said, because iniquity shall abound, he said, the love of many shall wax cold. So there are many people, even those who are born again, that will fall by the wayside. And I gave you five reasons why many will fall. Number one, I said is iniquity. He said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall what? Wax cold. Number two, I said the cares of this life. In Mark 4, 19, because of legitimate things like what to eat, where to lay your head, you need a job. These are things that will trigger compromise that will make many to fall away. 
And then the Bible also spoke about the deceitfulness of riches. Because of the little people have. You know, the way the world system works is that it can define your value system based on what you have. But the Bible told us already that a man's value is not in the multitude of his possession. But the world will make you feel that because you are wearing a diamond ring, because you are driving in a Rolls Royce, you are more important than the other person who is trekking. Meanwhile, there's a realm where cars have no value because you move at the speed of thought. Now, if you translate to that realm, what will define you? A realm where metals don't need to carry you as you think it, you are there. Hope you know that when the angels migrate, they don't need a car. They operate at the speed of thought. So if you come to the angelic realm and your value is in diamond and gold, it means you are useless. So there are things that bequeath value much more than what we wear and what we eat and what we drive in. But the Bible said many will be deceived by reason of their possession. It calls it the deceitfulness of riches. All of these things are forces that makes for the great falling away. The reason many will no longer be in the course to fulfill God's, God's agenda. And then also we have persecution and warfare. So if you refuse to fall by reason of iniquity, by reason of cares of life, by reason of deceitfulness of riches, the devil will come aggressively. Why have you refused to fall? Why did you fall with those fornicating? Why did you fall with those who are deceived by wealth? You must fall. And they will come with warfare. But you see, we, there are those who have stamina to survive. And so nothing will pull them out of the hands of the master. They will remain until the end of time. But you see, unfortunately, many will fall away. Many. Say the love of many shall wax cold. Many will fall away. And that's the first program of the last day. A technology devised from darkness to see that many who were on fire for God will suddenly become lukewarm and they will lose their rank and their status in Zion. You know, God, these things break the heart of the Father. When God came into the garden, suddenly Adam, who was a prince of Zion, was no longer in the assembly, in the conclave. Meanwhile, matters of legislation about earth was carried out and the prince of earth was absent. And God showed up from his throne. Hey, Adam, hey, Adam, where are thou? There's an agenda for the earth. You are the ambassador of earth to the heavens. How come you have not appeared in the meeting? Unfortunately, the guy had been deceived by the serpent. He was no longer making appearance beyond the galaxies of God. And he fell. And many will fall that way. Men that God is trusting that they will take over Europe. They may end up in brothels. They may end up on their career thinking it's about survival and forget that there is an assignment in Zion. Many will fall away. But you see, because of the great falling away, there is also a second program that Jesus initiated before he left. It's called the Great Commission. In Mark chapter 16 verse 15, he said, go into all the worlds, all the spheres of influence and disciple all nations. Matthew 28 verse 18, all power in heaven and on earth is given to me. You go into what? All the wars. And so the reason you are in the parliament, the reason you are in the hospital, the reason you, have, you found yourself in the academia is not just because you need a job. It's because it's a platform. We were sent into all the wars. So you will need your training and expertise as a doctor to function there. But over and above that, you are a kingdom ambassador. And so you must leave an imprint of Zion in that territory where you are because you were sent. Now, because of the Great Commission, many who fell will be restored. So what we are talking about, the coming revival, some harlots will be global evangelists. That's what I'm saying. Some men who didn't come to church again for 20 years, suddenly the fire of heaven will fall on them and they will go back and do great damage to the kingdom of darkness because we are not, see, we are not going into the world because we are zealous. We are going into the world because there's a cause. It's a necessity is laid upon me. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Sometimes, you said you, you are visiting 12 nations in 12 months. Somebody will look at you and say, what kind of zeal is that? They don't know the urgency in the spirit. If you don't go to Italy, an apostle may never wake up. If you don't go to Germany, a, a prophetess will never rise. 
And so God is not sending you there because he wants to increase your ministry necessarily. It's because somebody is asleep. And there's something he has put in your voice that when you cry, that person will come alive because of the agenda of God. This is what God is doing. There's a great commission. And everybody who carries the DNA of Christ must represent Christ in his sphere of influence. And so after the great commission, there's the great awakening. He said in Ephesians 5.14, Awake, awake, thou that sleepest. It says, rise up from the dead, the bed of death, and Christ will give you light. But you see, that awakening will take place at the instance of the appearing of those who are sent. And so when we show up, like John, when we cry, the whole of Jerusalem and Judea will go to us. And Jesus said he was a light, and you were willing to stay under him for a season. And so every territory have voices that must visit those territories so that the, the, the warriors there will wake up. Without the Great Commission, there will be no Great Awakening. And if there's no Great Awakening, many who fall away will end up in hell. But we say no. Everyone who is part of this fold must come back because there's a corporate heritage in Zion. And I told you, after the Great Awakening, there's the Great Tribulation. Because the devil no go agree. He will insist. He will keep insisting. And the day will come when God will say, okay, do what you want to do. We found, we studied that in Revelation 13. He said, the beast was allowed to torment the saints, to war with them and to subdue them. But it was for a season. But you see, as you study further, you now go to Revelation 17, you hear that, some saints were in white robes and the Bible said these ones came out of the great tribulation. So even the tribulation can't stop us. But the devil will be allowed to do his worst. He will now discover that there is something we have encountered in God that is deeper than everything life has to offer. Because for us, life is a person. He said this is eternal life that you may know him. Our knowledge of God is deeper than anything in time. And so no matter what the devil does, we will we'll be standing. And then after the great tribulation, there's the great white throne judgment. And in Revelation 20 from verse 11 to 15, the Bible said, a white throne appeared. And it said, all men, those who have died, those who are alive, he said, they will come before that throne. And he said, books will be open. And he said, another book will be open, which is the book of life. He said, whomsoever's name is not found written in the book of life, he said, that one will be cast into the lake of fire. So there are two dimensions of judgment. The first dimension of judgment is for salvation. That's for those who are in Christ Jesus because only Christ passed the standard of God. So those of us who are born again, we are in Christ. When we appear before the white throne, we are covered with Jesus. So God will see Jesus and allow us pass. <laughs> but when we cross the white throne, we will now appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Christ will now say, Kai, you can't hide, come out. What did you do with faith? What did you do with eternal life? What did you do with the anointing? We will now be rewarded for our works. So if you study Revelation 20, 11 to 15, there is a judgment based on the book of life. There is also a judgment based on the book of works. The book of life is salvation. It is the works of Jesus that will carry you through. But the book of works is what you have done. It says God will not be unrighteous to forget your labor of love. It's on the strength of that that you cannot sleep while you are in time. Yes, sir. You must participate in the assignment and the mandate of the kingdom. Yes, sir. You may sleep now and think you are wise. It's foolishness. Jesus said, lay up for yourself treasures where thieves cannot break in, neither moth can destroy. The way you lay up that treasure is by service in the house of God. You must insist. You know, the fathers of old knew God to a level. Those days when they punish people, they exonerate them from service. You will no longer sweep church. And that is punishment. And people will beg because they know something about eternity that we no longer know. We are carried away by movies. <laughs> Those days they taught them about the realities of heaven. And men had genuine encounters with God. And so when a man is exonerated from walking in the house of God, that man considers it to be a torment. But in our generation, you have to give people a treat. Once in a while, supply tea, supply milk, so that they can come to church. Otherwise, they won't come. In fact, they think they are doing you a favor. It shows you that we are far from Zion. The realities of heaven is no longer something that is tangible in our generation. They said the books of works will be opened. And every labor we have put on the table, it will be judged. And on the strength of that, we will be rewarded. And this kind of reward is forever 
and ever. These are the five major programs that will take place. Now, if you know this, you will not sleep in Zion. Because every second, people are falling away. And you know that they will go to perpetual doom if you don't rise. So the reason you find us laboring night and day is because we have known that there is an agenda. The devil has an agenda. You know, Rehab Bonke said something. My goal is not anointing and power. He said, my goal is to depopulate hell and to populate heaven. The man had a first-hand encounter that many are falling away and they are doomed forever and ever until somebody preaches to them the message of salvation. This is what every worker in the house of God must come into understanding by experience. The reason you will lose your sleep, the reason you will give your resources, the reason you will endure rebuke, the reason you endure pain and reproach is because you know that everything you do is causing somebody to cross over from condemnation to acceptance. Crossing over from death to life. So for you, it's not something that you can negotiate for anything. You will pay the price to see it happen because you are giving meaning to somebody's existence and you are also bringing joy to the heart of the father because that is what gives the father joy. He said, whenever a soul is won, he said, there's great rejoicing before the presence of my father. This is what we live for. And this is why we submit ourselves to be equipped so that we are more productive. A year should not end until you have offering. Paul said he raised offering of men to God. On your account, let it be written that thousands came into Zion because of you. Let it be written that millions came into Zion because of you. That's what will cause your existence to count. Otherwise, what do you have to offer God? But when you get to Zion, many will salute you and say, welcome, I came here because of you. I found meaning in eternity because you lived. That's when the womb that bore you will be blessed. But you see, you must be trained. And we said there are a few things that we must become aware of in order to be productive in this kingdom mandate. I'm just doing a recap. That's why I'm a bit... Uh, <laughs> you know, yesterday, I started pushing and the power of God broke out. We couldn't teach. Today, it's not me that will do power. I will keep it calm until it comes up. <laughs> Glory to God. I said there are three dimensions of awakenings that we must have because I wanted to zero in on the awakening for now. Tomorrow, when I'm talking about power, the mysteries of power, that's when I will talk about those who are sent. Because when you are sent, you need weapons. Oh my God, you will need weapons. A, there is a level you will do this thing to. A prince will appear to you. A prince. This one, they will break the laws of the spirit and appear to you because they know if they don't stop you, a city can be taken. Because there are men who take cities, a whole city, when they appear and cry. The Bible says when Jonah cried, everybody in the nation repented. Even animals fasted. So if you find such a man coming into your city, if you need to mobilize 10 principalities, you will mobilize them. You don't care the judgment. This man must be stopped because even animals will repent if he comes. And there are such men today in our generation. And you will leave this conference as such a man. <laughs> You will leave this meeting as such a man. Praise God. So I said there are three dimensions of awakening. Number one, I said it's an awakening to the love and fatherhood of God. And the reason is simple. It is your awakening to the love of God that brings assurance to your spirit. That's what confers dominion to you. And that's what makes you to survive the arrow of condemnation because the devil will fight you from within before he fights you from without and there are many Christians today who are not sure God loves them so even while they are working with God and for God it is a performance thing they think God loves them more as they perform more so they don't enjoy fellowship all their lives they are trying to do something to impress God and so even that thing they are doing loses genuineness it's just like eye service. Somebody's not walking until you are looking around. That kind of service is not genuine. You will not enjoy it. This is why even things like prayer that we should enjoy have become a body. 
Because many people pray to meet time. Because they feel if they don't pray for two hours in a day, God will not be happy. They feel if they don't pray for one hour in a day, God will not be favorably disposed towards them. So prayer for them is not fellowship. Prayer for them is a body. And so they are praying and they are struggling. But there's somebody else who knows that this thing is a love relationship. So when he stands before God, the heavens open. He's having deep intercourse with the Holy Spirit. He's having encounters. He's receiving instructions. And so for him, prayer is not time bound. Prayer for him is ascension to realms in Zion. He can be driving and praying. He can be baiting and praying. He can have a quiet time and he'll be praying. It becomes an unbroken relationship with God because he is not trying to do something to meet a roll call. He is just living life in the spirit. And the only time you can enter that depth of work with God is when you know that God loves you unconditionally. And the way the apostles painted the picture was through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus because Jesus is the best God has. And so every time the gospel is preached, the attempt is to show you the love of God. And so Paul was speaking in Romans chapter 5 verse 8. He said, why we were yet sinners? Why we were useless in God's agenda? He said, Christ died for us. So what did God do? He took the risk of giving his best for us, even when we were not reasonable to choose him. Now, Isaiah had told them already by prophetic intelligence that all we like sheep, Isaiah 53 verse 8, verse 6, have gone astray. Every one of us rebelled against God. In that state of rebellion, even before we were preached to, he said, Jesus died for us. Do you know what it means? You are rebelling against somebody and he gave his best, hoping that you will become reasonable one day. What if you never become reasonable? The love of God is willing to take that risk. And so in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, Paul said that if God did not withhold his only begotten son, he said, but gave him freely for us. He said, how shall he not with him give us all things? You know what that means? That means God. there's nothing in God that can be withheld from me. It's on the strength of this that you can make demands. You know, some of the visions we have, when we see it, it looks scary. You stand up, you say, this year we are going to spend half a million dollars. And somebody's wondering, do you have savings? Jesus is my savings. If Jesus was giving for me, anything God will do for that money will come out. It's already done. That's the mentality. But if you don't know the love of God, you can't make such steps. There are times when you appear in a place and everywhere is dry. But people came sick. You know the power of God will have to move here now. You shake yourself as at other times. You don't feel any anointing. But you know something. If Jesus was giving for you, power cannot be withheld from you. So when you see people who do exploit in the kingdom, they know something about the love of God. And when you see people who struggle in the kingdom, they have not realized the love and fatherhood of God. It's a basic revelation, but it's foundational if you will be effective in kingdom service. In fact, I was reading for them yesterday from Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5. And Paul took time to do a thorough breakdown. He showed us seven sacrifices of Jesus that revealed the depth of God's love. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He said, although he was equal with God, he didn't consider it a privilege that he should clinch onto. And then he began to show us. He said, number one, Jesus laid aside the privileges of deity. And I asked us a question yesterday. Do you know what the privileges of deity is? Maybe you should begin with King Charles and find out the enormous privilege he enjoys. The king of England does not need a visa. He does not even need a passport. If he comes to your country, I am King Charles. I am the passport. Carrying a passport is a body. And he is the one who signs on your own passport to make it valid. That, that's the privilege of a king. If he's coming to your country, he doesn't need to carry money. If he comes to your country, he will shut down your country's protocol. Your president will first of all receive him. And after receiving him, they will treat him to the highest level of courtesy and reception that is available in that country. The highest level of comfort is what he will enjoy. And then he doesn't know how much is flight fare. He doesn't know if they book flight. You, you sit in first class, you say, I'm a big man. The, the, the plane he flies is first class. He doesn't know how much they fuel it. All of that is called privilege of royalty. 
Now, the being we are talking about here, all the kings of the world put together, all the presidents of the world put together, in all of time, their privileges is nothing compared to his in one day. And Jesus, the Bible said, he put aside that privilege because he wanted to come save you. You now ask yourself, who am I? And that's not all. Number two, the Bible said he removed the status of God. This is a being that created all things that is worshipped from time immemorial. The Bible said millions of millions of angels worship him day and night unending. He removed that status and stepped down from his throne as God. And the Bible said he became human. The message version said it's an incredibly humbling process. And as human, he was not the best among men. The Bible said he chose to be a slave among men. So much so that he was born in a manger where donkeys sleep. That's where he was born. And even as a slave man, the Bible said he didn't enjoy any privilege that men enjoy. Rather, he lived a selfless and obedient life. And he was not just obedient, hoping to receive something. He said it was an obedience unto death. And it's not just any death, the death of a criminal. So he descended from Godhood to criminalhood because he wanted to save you. That's to give you a glimpse into the depths of the love of the Father. If you will do anything big for God, if you will manifest the power of God, if you will host the glory of God, if you will do kingdom business for God without being a casualty, you must know something about the love of God. Because there are many times where you will be at your lowest ebb. The only assurance that will be there in your spirit is that God loves me. We have planned, we have planned meetings before. One day to the meeting, no money anywhere. We were at the brinks of embarrassment. We went to pray. There was no utterance. Which one will you pray? You have not paid for venue. They told you in two hours time, you can't use it again. Flyer is already up. Even flights you have not booked. The money you need to pay for sound, music, nothing is on ground. And the time, every second, ticks like eternity is moving. And there's no hope anywhere. The only thing that gives you assurance is that God will not allow me to be put to shame. You just know that this God loves you too much. In fact, when we were making this comparison yesterday, we looked at Matthew chapter 7 verse 7. He said, ask, you receive. Seek, you will find. Knock, the door will be open for you. Not because you are a faith giant, but because God is too faithful to fail. He said, as wicked as your earthly parents are. And I asked them a question. Is your father wicked? Is your mother wicked? He's not telling you that your parents are wicked. He's telling you that the love your parents have towards you compared to the love of God is wickedness. Because God loves you unconditionally. And there's nothing you can do to stop God from loving you. It's too late. As wicked as your earthly parents are. See, hear me. If you want to do big things for God, you must be convinced that God loves you. Because the part of the kingdom is a very treacherous part. Friends will betray you. Family will betray you. Even those you serve and those who serve you will betray you. The only thing that will keep you going in the midst of the crisis and the storm is the everlasting arm of God that is ever open towards you. You know how it works? Even when you betray God, God won't leave you. The prodigal son received his inheritance, squandered it. He no longer had a place in his father's house. The Bible tells us when he came to himself, even him judged himself that he was not qualified to be called a son. And he said, I will go to my father and tell him, treat me like one of your slaves. I don't qualify for nothing. When he was coming, before he said what he rehearsed, the father ran towards him, hugged him, kissed him, gave him his signet ring, removed his garment, put on him, and gave him his sandals. You know what happened there? The guy no longer have an inheritance. So what the father did was to give him his own place. That's what the father did. You no longer have the place of a son. So what I do is that I exchange my place for you. I am the servant. You are the father. That's the depth of the love of God. If you know this, sir, nothing on earth can shake you. When you find men that can't break, what sustains them is the love of God. And trust me, you can't do kingdom business until you know the love of God.
you will find many things that should discourage you. You know, sometimes people call us as pastors. Oh, I had this challenge. They don't know how many we have. <laughs> Somebody is telling you about this problem. You are saying you are enjoying. If this is problem, I want to have it. But you see, they don't have an idea. Because you come up every week, you have to smile. You have to stir their faith up. You have to encourage them. They assume all is well. Many times we are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But we fear no evil. Why? Because we know that God is with us. He said there's no enchantment against Jacob. There's no divination against Israel. Why? Because the shout of the king. That if you know God is with you, there's an assurance. An assurance that imparts the power of dominion that he puts upon you. We break too easily. We break. People get discouraged serving God. You have to pamper them. You have to encourage them. You have to give them money. You have to talk to them kindly to be able to serve God. You can't go far like that. If you want to carry nations on your shoulders for Jesus, be ready for battles. But the cure to every affliction is the love of God. It will heal you. It will strengthen you. It will empower you. It will give you assurance to go through the storm. And nothing will ever destroy or overpower you. This is the first encounter that every kingdom steward must have. The second encounter is an encounter with the resurrection power of God. That's the power of eternal life. In Romans chapter 6 verse 4 to 5, the Bible made us understand that we died with him and were buried in the likeness of baptism. And he said, as he was raised back from the dead by the glory of the Father, he said, we too must walk in the newness of life. We must walk. You know what it means is that nothing dies in your hands. You have gone past the grave. You are walking in the ascended realm of life. And I told you, the concept behind that truth is worth birth's faith in your spirit. The idea behind that understanding is that for you, God is not going to do anything anymore. God has already done everything. Anything you declare is what you have. So, this is where power is triggered from. Listen, when you come to pray for the sick, God is not healing any sick person again. Every sick person has been healed. It is your job to call those things that be not as though they were. So when you see people do great things for God, there is something they know. They know that it is done. They know that it is finished. They know that it is perfected. When Jesus hung on the cross and said it is finished, the battle is over. Every battle you enter now, you enter as a more than a conqueror. You enter now as him that has overcome the world. This is what the Bible said. It said, whoever is born of God, overcome the world. He said, this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith. Many are not aware. So every day of their life, they keep assessing the mountain. They keep analyzing the mountain. And all they see is the impossibility. But the man who has gone beyond the grave know that impossibility is already behind him. And so when he confronts a mountain, he is confronting the mountain from an ascended position. You send somebody to a city and he comes back and tells you, that's a city of giants. You can't take them. Do you know who you are? You are not a giant. You are not even a giant slayer. You are more than a conqueror. The battle is over. You are one who takes the spoils. Your job is to take the spoils. But you see, whether you will go back and fight, whether you will be defeated, whether you will take the spoils, is a function of where you are in your consciousness. This is why in Colossians chapter 3 from verse 1 to 3, Paul said, if we say we are dead with Christ and risen with him, he said, let our consciousness, our minds, our affection be on the things we are above. Above. We have gone ahead. We have gone above. We have already overcome. We are not trying to overcome. We have overcome already. We are living from the overcoming realm of life. And I told you, when God tells us to operate like this, he's not psyching us. You know why? He has installed some things in our spirits. Eternal life is a token of resurrection. The Holy Ghost is a token of resurrection. 
when God gave you eternal life, is a seal to prove that you are no longer going to the grave. It's a proof that you have come out of the grave. That's why in 2 Timothy 1.10, it said he has revealed life and immortality through the gospel. What is immortality? It's a realm of no corruption. It's a realm of perfection. It's a realm of no failure. But you see, many cannot activate that realm because they are still talking like people hoping to come out of the grave. We don't talk like people hoping to come out of the grave. We talk like people who have left the grave behind us. And so when you talk about the challenge, we have overcome. We have overcome. He said, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. What is that victory? Whoever is born of God. We were born from the grave. We have overcome the grave. We live in the realm of more than conquerors. If you know this, nothing will be a challenge anymore. If they tell you it's a challenge, you say no. It's a platform for testimony. Hope you know everybody who testifies, testifies by overcoming impossibilities. But it's a mentality. They tell you, two people went to that territory, they failed. You say, that's why I need to go there. It's, if it's where everybody is going, then, I mean, it's not an assignment. How many went? Two. That's, that's a great place. Take me there. They say, ah, it's not easy. That's why I'm going there. I carry something that is superior to the grave. I carry something that is superior to death. Even if it was not working, if I become a part of it, it must work. Because there's something about me. I carry the life of God. I carry the glory of God. I carry the power of God. All I need to do is to decree a thing and it shall be established unto me. I didn't know this. I kept struggling. Even when I fast, even when I pray, my consciousness will make it of non-effect. I will fast for three days and still struggle with, struggle with the situation. I will pray in tongues for hours and still struggle with the situation. Until God told me. He said, your prayer and your fasting is to help you release what's on your inside. The mountain is not your challenge. The mountain is your unbelief. If you now know that you have overcome the grave, you will function from the future, not the past. Go and check your Bible. Everything, almost everything in the New Testament is in past tense. You see, healed, forgiven, restored, everything, past tense. We've gone past the grave. But many don't know. And so when you give them assignments, they come with excuses and complaints. They give you a thousand reasons why it cannot be done. But those who are kingdom oriented, that same reason you give why it cannot be done is the reason they will come back with testimonies. When we started traveling, they will tell you some territories are so hard. If you go there, you can't take it over. I said, that's why we go there. We have the breakers anointing. When we show up, we break it. That's who we are. We are born of God. We are not born of men. We are born of God. And so we are masters of impossibilities. And the way God did it was that he inaugurated us into this operation in the resurrection. So that we live the life superior to death. I told my people, don't think you'll get another life in eternity. This same life we have now, sir, is the same life that we'll use to transport in eternity. There are no cars in eternity. So if we are using cars now, it means there's something about eternal life we don't know. This same life is what we, all of us here, we use in eternity. This same life. You know the difference? Understanding will change. There's something you will know after the rapture that will make you discover that cars are a waste of time. This life is what you will use to move in heaven, to bilocate in the world to come. So it's not something that happened to Philip because Philip is special. It's something that happened to Philip because he caught an understanding that with this life, you can move to Asotot by the wind. This same life. This same life is the life you will carry in eternity that you'll be ageless. This same life is the life you will carry in eternity that will make you impregnable to any limitation. So if we don't have it here, it means it's because our understanding is not yet perfect. So what the Holy Ghost comes to do is to help you understand it more. 
And the more you know it, the more invincible you become. But you see, the foundational principle of operating this life is to know that you are more than a conqueror. Is to know that you have overcome. It's not to think struggling with the circumstance. It's to think the circumstances behind you. So everything that was a challenge for others becomes a platform of testimony for you. It's a key to effectiveness in the kingdom. If you know this, any assignment given to you, you tell yourself, it is done. It is done. That's all. It is done. There's no such thing as, oh, let's try and see. No, there's nothing. It is done. Go to Germany. It's done. I'll come back with results. Go to Holland. It's done. I'll come back with results. Because this economy has no regard for age or gender. It's not, oh, I'm a lady. I don't know what to do. No way. Whoever is born of God overcomes the world. I carry the life of God. Anywhere I go, I take over. You don't even have to be in the fivefold ministry. The Bible said Philip went to Samaria. The guy was a deacon. You know who a deacon is? An usher. That means those who stand at the door to welcome people should be the ones taking cities. Today people go to Bible seminaries and come back. They still cannot affect a small neighborhood. Because they have scriptures they are quoting but they have not been born into the realms of power. Hey, 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 hey. Yahweh, Yahweh. Hey, hey, hey. I release the sound of the heaven, the sound of creation. Shekinah is here. I release the sound. Ephesians 3.20 It says God is able to do Exceeding abundantly But It's above what you ask or think That means what you ask or think Is what can determine Whether God will be able to do Because what you ask or think Is what regulates the power at work On your inside You can think something and stop the flow Of eternal life And you can think something and release the flow you can think something and stop the flow of the anointing. You can think something and release the flow. Somebody asked me, they said, why don't cameramen get slain? I said, we don't want them slain. The anointing is not without intelligence. The anointing is operating based on what we are thinking. There are those we are ministering to part-time. What you think, what you say is what determines it. You say it's impossible, it becomes impossible. You say it is done already, <laughs> it will be done even before you know it. I decree over someone here, you will begin to scale unimaginable heights. Yahweh. Yahweh. Yeah. 
for a moment. Do you know why I'm sharing this? Listen. Our minds have not been prepared for what God wants to do. You know, when we talk power, we are only talk, thinking blind eyes, deaf ears. Look at the word system. I was sharing with Apostle Wendy when we drove to the hotel. Elon Musk just wakes up overnight and he thinks of invading the transport system and altering it. Invested in electric vehicles and today his cars are dominating UK and Europe. Billions of dollars is one of many things. He invades space and says no. Space travel cannot just be a function of government and the military. It should be something that individuals can also power. The guy said he went to Russia and told them, do you have rockets you are not using? I want to buy. <laughs> See the way these guys are thinking without the Holy Ghost. I want to buy some rockets because I, I needed a, a, a supervisory engineer. I, none of them want to work with me because they think if I'm not government, they can't do it. I want to buy one and know how it works. Today, SpaceX is already dominating there. And he has come even into the miracle world where we are. Using genetic engineering and AI to start curing paralysis by brain surgery. Imputing chips that... You do, see the way these guys are thinking. You want to do crusade today, we will need 30 people, 50 people, 100. Sometimes I sit down and I tell myself, God, we just want to do five crusades. 20, 30 people have to sow seeds to us to do it. Why can't we have one person who is throwing and say, yes, what are the crusade budget for one year? Take, please. What, which other thing? Take. <laughs> with all the Holy Ghost we preach, with all the power move, go and check the trends in the world today. How many of them are coming from church? Even the secular musicians. If they come to UK, they will, it's the largest venues they look for. Largest. What is the largest stadium here? That's all they ask. And they shut it down. Go to the government today. Many godless people without religion. Approving policies that is choking the move of God. When we think power, we don't think economic power. We don't think governmental power. Even the miracle working power. We are excited when people fall down. Not even tangible things. Somebody should hold cancer and pull it out. As if it, 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 it's not religion. Oh, I, I release the fire now. I release, why are you carrying cancer? Come out. Casually. But you see, there are things our minds can't handle. We, we can't think it. So God is not able to do. We can't say it. So God is not able to do. But you see, when you know the love of God and you understand the power of the resurrection, nothing will be too big for you to think or say. At the age of 17, David confronted Goliath. He didn't think twice. What was he thinking? The Bible said when Goliath advanced towards David, he said David charged at him. The guy knew that Goliath would go down. He was too motivated. That's the generation of the overcomers. But there is something you know to operate that way. There is something you know. I know God loves me and he's got my back. And I also know there is a power at work on my inside. And that power operates based on what I say. Whether I say it in the future or in the past is what determines the direction the power will move. And so everything you say, you say it in the sense of a finished work. And have an assurance that God is with you. God loves you beyond your performance. In fact, it's in his loving you that you grow and improve. Because we need a generation that can shape and reshape this world. Jesus knew what he was leaving behind. 500 men, he left the whole universe for them. See how many of us are here. And we still think taking the UK is a big deal. 
Meanwhile, they were in the upper room. 120 people were thinking the whole world. Because they knew something eternal was on their inside. They knew something immortal was there on their inside. Listen, any sector you are going to, begin to think globally. There's enough backing and there's enough power. If you are in the economic space, think of global investments. Don't limit yourself. When you pray, when you fast, and I'm going to talk about consecration now, you are generating energy. You are generating powers that will bring those things to pass. Think it. And you'll be shocked it will start happening. I'm not surprised that I'm in the UK today. I would have been surprised if I'm not. Because many years ago, we said we will come here and shake this land. Many years ago, it will never fail. It will always come to pass. Because what is in you will respond to the assurance you have in God and it will respond to your thinking and talking. Yes, they are the first two encounters you must have if you will be relevant in God's agenda. Because what God is doing is global. You can't be local. He said it's from Jerusalem to Judea to the uttermost part of the earth. You are a businessman. You are an investor. Think of Africa. Think of Asia. You are an evangelist. Think of Asia. Think of the Americas. Think of Africa. Don't think of one, one small church where you are there with uh, 20 people. You say God is good. God is. If, you are, if, it, if it's only your kind that are on earth with this kingdom tribe, and as you do it, you will see the backing of God. Because that's what he's looking for. There are dimensions of powers that we need to see again. And I will show you some of them as I talk about consecration. Because this is where we come into true entrustments. There are five dimensions of consecration. And please, don't miss me now. Everything we spoke about in the first and second, this is where they are truly entrusted. When you start being consecrated. Because the authorities and the powers that God gives, they can kill and they can make a life. And so God is careful to what measure he allows men to handle. So what you can handle in God is determined by the quality of your consecration. And so if you want more in God, know that there are consecrations that will be demanded. Because that's the platform that we host all of God. And there are five layers of consecration. The first layer of consecration is what we call the generic believer's consecration. These are consecrations that everyone who says is a believer must have. Listen, Christianity brings you into liberty, not lawlessness. There is nothing in God that is without a protocol that regulates it. And every believer who wants to handle true power, power that is not just tangible but can change his world, must be ready to live a consecrated life. And I will show you a few examples in scripture. Men who shook the heavens and the earth. And you will see that the reason they were able to do that much was because their consecrations was potent enough to power it. But a first of all begins with the believer's consecration. The believer's consecration is fivefold in operation. Number one, it is purity. When a man begins to live a consecrated life, there's a dimension that will touch on purity. The second dimension of the believer's consecration is self-control or self-restraint. No being will commit power to you if you have not mastered the art of self-control. Not even the devil. If you have met those who walk in darkness, you will be shocked. The level of consecration they have to keep. I'm telling you, Christians think that kingdom business is a careless business. So somebody who doesn't have a consecrated life just shows up. 
and he's talking, we will take over the UK. You don't know the priesthood that sustained this land. <laughs> you don't know the weight of priesthood that determines the navigations in this territory. If you know, you will, you, you will humble yourself first to, for the Holy Ghost to help you in the area of consecration. Self-control and restraint. Number three, in the believer's consecration is service. A man who is not oriented and predisposed towards service cannot handle power. There are certain things that God can't even consider you unless you are sold out in the course of service because they are required for service. They are required for kingdom advancement. As simple as gifts of the spirits are, like word of knowledge, if you are not given to evangelism, you may never walk in one. You can apply all the principles of working in the gift, but the gift is given for service. And so if you want to handle certain dimensions of power, service must become a consecration. I will list some specific consecrations for you, but I'm just telling you the, the general aspects of the believer's consecration. From purity to self-control and restraint to service, then to devotion to God. That's where prayer comes in. That's where study comes in. That's where fasting comes in. You are not consistent in prayer. You are not consistent in communing with God to receive signals from heaven. You think God will give you the destiny of London. How can you know God's position and God's mind towards the land part time if you are a stranger on the altar? Do you know how many powers are in this land? How many souls are in this territory? You will require a level of devotion to God for God to tell you, exercise dominion over London. Because if there's any signal from heaven, you can pick it. It's on the strength of that signal that you can give laws and legislation over the land. But if you are not devoted to God, you will never be entrusted with that level of power. And so you have devotion. It's a major aspect of the believer's consecration. And then you have sacrifice. What you can receive is directly proportional to what you can give. If you can't give, you will not have room to receive. It's a law in this kingdom. It's a give, it shall be given unto you. If nothing can leave you, nothing can come to you. And so when God is giving entrustments to men, go and check their portfolio in the spirit. There's a weight of sacrifice. And so when we talk consecration, these are broad dimensions of the believer's consecration. Now, let me outline some specific consecration that touches on some of these dimensions for a believer's life. Look at sacrifice, for example. God told Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, from verse 1 to 3. He said, get thee out of thy country. Get thee out of thy kindred. Get thee out of thy father's house. And go to the land that I will show you. And he said, in blessing, I will bless you. And God began to say a lot of things. He said, he that blesses you is blessed. He that costs you is cost. And he said, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That was a promise. He never experienced it. Until Genesis chapter 22, from verse 1. He said, now God had told Abraham to take his son Isaac, the one that he loves, and take him to one of the mountains of Moriah, and there sacrifice him as an offering. And in verse 5, Abraham came and told the men, he said, wait, we are going yonder to worship. That's to tell you the kind of heart that the man had. That's what will determine the power that he could wield, or he will ever wield. And when Abraham went up, even the son asked him, where is the sacrifice? He said, God will provide. He had given the guy up in his heart. And when Abraham lifted his hand to kill the boy, from verse 11 to 14, God told him, don't raise your hand against the boy. He said, now I know. The question is, I thought you were omniscient. What do you mean by now I know? Don't you know the end from the beginning? Of course it does. But you have to prove it because there's a legality in the realm that you are able to sacrifice so that you can handle the power. It was after that was done that God now swore by himself. He said, by myself have I sworn. In blessings, I will bless you. You move two chapters later. Genesis 24 verse 1. He said, Abraham was old and was stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed him in all things. You cannot become until your consecration take you there. And sacrifice is one of it. 
In 2 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 19, he said, the standard of the law standeth sure. He said, therefore the Lord knoweth them that are his. That is purity. He said, they that name the name of the Lord, he said, they must depart from iniquity. He now told us, in a great house, there are many vessels. Some are of gold, some silver, some is wood, some is hay. He said, what makes you a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor? It's not that you are silver or gold. It has nothing to do with it. That's why you can be white or black. It doesn't matter. He said, if a man purges himself from these things, you cannot carry garbage and hope to receive entrustment from Zion. No, he said, if a man purges himself from these things, he said, then he will what? Be meat. The word meat is the word qualified for the master's use. That's when God gives you authority. You know, some people see God using people to shake nations and they sit down and say, I'm more intelligent than him. Who told you they are using brain there? I can, I can teach the Bible better. If you are a good Bible teacher, go to a theological seminary. They need you there. If it has to do with kingdom assignment, they are not looking for people who are good ex ex exegists. They are looking for those who carry the life and power of God. And it will take consecration for it to find expression. Did you not read about Joseph? Genesis 49 verse 9. Potiphar's wife threw herself at him. The guy knew that the destiny of Israel was resting on his shoulder. He will need powers over Egypt for him to be able to deliver on the mandate of Zion. He said, how can I do this evil and sin against God? He said, your master, my master has not withheld anything from me except you. How can I do this evil? God registered it. Because all of the things he was going through were trials for power. Power is not committed to everybody. It can be available to everybody in Christ, but only those who are consecrated can, can draw from it. That's why all of us are Christians. Yet not all of us cast out devils. Not all of us are taking nations. Not all of us are invading territories and bringing the government of God. It's available to all of us because of the love of God, because of the resurrection. But how much you draw is a function of your consecration. If a man purges himself, that's when he can draw from the everlasting fountains of God. Listen, if you don't do this, you will not be relevant in eternity. You must do it. But for you to do it and succeed, consecration must become the price that you pay. And there's a purity-based consecration. Did you not read about Paul? There's a restraint or self-control-based consecration. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I beat my body. I bring it under subjection. Somebody says he wants to take a nation and he cannot sit down to study. If he feels like sleeping, he sleeps. He operates at the frequency of feeling. When you ask him, he said, I felt like, who told you those who take nations operate how they feel? They say, oh, go for a training. Oh, no, Kai, my back, my back was aching and I need to wake up tomorrow. I have not slept enough. You will sleep where? There's a place where all of us will sleep indeed. The Bible said there's a place called the grave. There you will sleep. Nobody will trouble you to go for devotion. Nobody will trouble you to fast. Nobody will trouble you to go for workers training. You will sleep there until your whole flesh will sleep away. Even the bones will decay. Our time is rest in peace. That's what they call it. Our time here is limited. You beat your body. It's self, self restraint and bring yourself under subjection. There are times you need to sleep, but kingdom won't let you. There are times you need to go for a vacation, and there's nothing wrong. Go as much as is, you have the time. But there are times where you can't live like every other person. It's the consecration of the believer. From purity to self-control to sacrifice, and then to devotion to God. Wow! You don't pray, you don't fast, you don't study, you want to move the power of God, the hand of God. It's not that cheap, sir. It's not that cheap. For you to even discern the movements of the Spirit, it may take hours of priesthood to begin to know the difference between the air and the wind called Ruach HaKodesh. It will take time to know the difference. That what is blowing is not what a fan is producing. It's what is coming from Zion. It will take time to know that the sounds you are hearing it's not the keyboard. It's the voice of many waters. It will take time to be able to know when to climb from the sound of the keyboard to the songs of song. 
the sounds of the spirit where angels are whispering echoes from eternity and those echoes become the ladders through which you are sent to heights and it's from those heights that you can stand and speak and say let London be free that will not be the voice of a man it will be the shout of the king and when you talk from that height even the gates of cities will open did you not read he said who shall ascend the mountains of God who shall stand upon his holy hills he said it is they that are of a pure hand they've not lifted up their soul in vanity these are the ones it's from Zion we stand and we shout Shabak and doors of nations can open there's an alignment there's a procession Jericho does not fall because you came with trumpet Jericho will fall because you align with the armies of heaven. There's a gate called Mahanai where you dance the dance of the spirit. At that point, even your laughter becomes a weapon. There's a place of synchronization. There's a place of alignment where the warriors of earth become one with the warriors of heaven. And whatever you are doing, no matter how powerless it is, an army can go down. The Lord is good and his mercies endure forever. And Moab, Ammon, and Mount Seir can attack themselves. 18 million men can die just because you are making a sound. That's not just a sound. They are rhythms of war. They are terms of alignment. They are realms in Zion. But how can you know that language if there's no consecration to take you there? They were looking for Daniel. They thought he was part of those who are going on holidays. No. The guy said, you can give people positions. He said, I will sit at the gate. And while he was there at the gate, a hand appeared and wrote something. Nobody knew the language. If you don't know the language, how do you interpret it? They now discovered this man probably is traveling through realms that we don't know. And when they brought Daniel, there was no need to go consult anyone. He said, God has exalted you. He has given you a kingdom that expands the whole earth. And you decided to worship the God of iron and of stone. He said, it's for that reason that this hand came. He could tell you why the judgment came. So this guy is not guessing. And he went further to step two by reading it. Mene, mene. Take care And he went to step three by interpreting it. He said, mene means higher. You think they take Babylon by talking? No. You take Babylon by sitting at the gate. There is a power that consecration brings into your vessel. This is why when you start consecrating, your, your, your flesh will rebel. But like Paul, you will beat it and bring it under subjection. You will beat it because your generation wants to hear something that is stronger than Queen's English. They want to hear the echoes of eternity. Your voice must travel yonder until when you speak, it becomes like the sounds of many waters. That's the generation God is looking for. Men that can walk on earth, but their heads will be in the spirit. Because they are part of the assembly of Zion. When they talk, they read scrolls from eternity. Judgments and legislations that were passed. Some of the territories that are in darkness today, the judgment was given 50 years ago. But no man can go there to collect the scroll. And so territories are in bondage because people who can ascend to Zion have not received scrolls to read them. It will take consecration for you to go to the high places of the spirit. And this is the heritage of every believer. Because every one of us should be as strong as David. And the weakest of us should be as a strong nation. But the only way you will get that level of strength is by the power and the weight of your consecration. Even when the king gave a law that no one should pray, Daniel could not stop. The Bible says three times in a day, Daniel prayed facing Jerusalem. I am not powerful in Babylon because I'm the friend of the king. I am powerful in Babylon because heaven, I climb to heaven. And even when the king has no choice and gives the law that I should be thrown to the lion's den, then I will show the king that what powers me is superior to his favor. Because the next day when the king came, Daniel was still alive. He said, has your God kept you? He knew that the man had a God. What is your consecration? You want to wield powers that are eternal. You must have a hiding place in God. It's called the believer's consecration. Ah. I wish I had time. 
to show you some things. I will call men and show you their consecration. Even Jesus, the Bible said in Mark 1.35, early in the morning, he went to a solitary place. He said, dear, he prayed. Jesus comes into the city from the mountain. He doesn't enter the city from his bedroom. He enters the city from Zion. That's why no demon can withstand him. No challenge could withstand him. Because while men are yet sleeping, he goes to a solitary place. And if you read your Bible, the Bible will say, and Jesus entered into the mountain. Oh, yeah. You don't climb it. They enter. It's a realm. It's not a hill. that you should manifest in your generation. The problem is that you, are, you don't have a consecration. So you are not gathered. Your consecration gathers you. It's like a converging lens. There's a focal point you will hit and you can draw the rays of the sun to set something black at least. But it will take a lot of consecrations to be gathered. Check your scripture. Everyone that moved the hand of God had a consecration. The patriarchs were known by their consecrations. Their consecration preceded their manifestations. Every time you find the path that Abraham walked, you will not meet tents, you will meet altars. Tents were temporary, but altars were eternal. Even when they were gone, generations later, those altars were still speaking. They were still speaking. They were still speaking. Some of them died because of their consecration. They were talking from heaven. He said, Abel gave a more excellent sacrifice than, than Cain, by the which God bore witness of him as righteous. And he said, even while he was dead, his voice was crying from the ground. They became immortals. Mortal men became immortals by the weights of their consecration. We think taking cities and territories is a joke. It's not. What you see today were born by priesthoods in darkness. If you want to change it, you must build a superior priesthood. I think I should call Randolph now. We're out of time. Huh. I will just mention the four others. Go and study it. The Bible said the Berean Christians were more noble than those in Thessalonica. When they heard Paul, they said they went to search to see if what he said was so. I will list them. So that my brother can come and roar like a prince. Malo Ravakaya. Lehila Furaste Frenata Luga Actas. Beraga Souza Havi Atwa. Lelelai. Manda prakta suru varakaya la lehatave kaziza. I'm seeing something descend like a, a, a flame of fire. <laughs> I'm seeing something is descending like a flame of fire. he gives that generation is the tongue that communicates the oracles of God. We call it utterance. When you talk, even demons can't restrain or withstand what you say because your words become the oracles of God. They are like laws and verdicts in the spirit. But you see, for you to move in utterance, your tongue must be touched with the coals of fire. He said in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. 
and his train filled the temple. And I saw also the seraphims and they had six wings. He said with twain, they covered their faces. With twain, they covered their feet and with twain, they flied. And as they were flying, he said, the guy saw the majesty and the holiness of God and he began to curse himself. He said, woe unto me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among the people of unclean lips. And suddenly, he said, one of the seraphims took a tongue and picked one of the coals of fire and touched my tongue. When your tongue is touched, it's loosened so that you can communicate the oracles of God. I see a flame of fire descending from the heights of Zion. And the tongues of men is about to be taught so that they can speak legislations over cities. So that they can speak legislations over nations. So that they can talk and the princes over territories will fall and all tasks will be erected. What just help me now? Help me now. Help me. The ceremony has begun. The tongue of the learned. The tongue sharper than the pen of a ready writer. Maleruna, Maraka, Telias. Telias, Telias. Lenke, Tonika, Barika, Zuzak. Like the wise men of Silo. Men that speak from the heights of Zion. Territories, we must go back to the ways of the patriarchs, the ancient landmarks, and one of it is the way of consecration. God spoke to Ezekiel, He told him, Lie on your right side and pray for Judah, for Israel, for 390 days. And He said, Turn to your left and lie for 40 days and pray for Judah. Ezekiel was in one room. For 430 days interceding for Israel and Judah. That's how you take nations. Without consecration, the powers of territories can open. He said, Epaphras, Colossians 4:12, is one of you, a born servant of Christ, laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect. If men of consecration don't rise, people can't stand perfect in territories. Lift your hands to what heaven. There is a power on the altar. A power. I know of powers to raise the dead. I know of powers to open deaf ears. I know of powers to open blind eyes. But none of them compares to the powers of the altar. God wants to consecrate some of you to the altar. Where nations are born. He said as soon as Zion traveled, she brought forth her children. Father, wherever they are standing, wherever they are standing, men that will become voices echoing from the altar, the power that consecrates men to the altar. There are five of them here by the Spirit. One, two, three, four, five. Carry that power. Carry that power. Carry that power.
some of you are pregnant with nations but those nations will not fulfill their prophetic destiny until Zion travails so your prayer is not about food to eat it's about nations to be born wherever you are standing let the hand of God that keeps men to the altar let it rest upon you receive that grace now Consecration called the stewardship consecration, where men are separated unto service in perpetuity. They serve with their time, they serve with their strength, they serve with their resources. That's how kingdoms move. If such men don't rise, kingdom can move. And see, there are men today who are making billions. They dedicate ninety percent to kingdom. They open a trust, set board members who sit on their money so that kingdom can move. They don't need to have connection with the people. It's called stewardship consecration. There's a consecration called the priesthood consecration. Where men are separated from the trends and the, the, the joy and pleasure of a civilization. That's why priests don't take alcohol. What inspires what gives others pleasure? They go under a vow and separate themselves. Well, how do you think the Catholic Church dominated the world? Because they were celibates. Men who consecrated themselves, their pleasure, the pleasure of marriage to God. Women, norms who dedicate themselves, their bodies to God. It's a priesthood consecration. And then there is the Nazarite consecration. People who consecrate themselves not to touch anything that defies. That's why the Nazarites don't touch the dead. Anything that brings defilement, they will never touch it. It's a vow. If they touch it, they will have to shave their hair and carry themselves through shame to prove that they have allowed defilement coming to them. And their job is to defend a nation and a territory. How do you think Samuel was so powerful? He was a Nazarite. Their wars don't fall to the ground. Those are powers. They are not gifted. They are entrusted. And then you have the eunuchs consecration. He says some were born eunuchs. Some were made eunuchs. He says others made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. So men castrated themselves and said because of the kingdom we will not waste our time to get married. We will live and deploy all our energy to advance God's kingdom. And these were the teachings of the patriarchs. Paul was teaching in 1 Corinthians 7. They say, if you are a virgin, remain so. You will serve God better. These were things that they were doing in the Old Testament. He said, if you marry, it's not a sin. But there were sons who dedicated. This is not a sin. But they dedicated the energy of their youth to the service of God. Jesus didn't marry. Paul didn't marry. Elijah didn't marry. You know, those are consecrations. These are the things that bring men to realms of power. But our generation, we are still struggling with the believer's consecration. People can't pray. People can't fast. You have to motivate them to go out for evangelism. They can't give. And we think we will take cities. That's why you hardly find men among us who are bigger than nations. In the days of the apostle, it was common. A deacon and go to Samaria and take the whole city. 
He, he's not inviting the apostle to help us. No, he's inviting them when the city has been conquered. He said, come, we are dedicating this city to you as an offering. Can we pray for a moment? Can we pray for the grace to handle powers that are going obsolete because we lack consecration? In the next 10, 15, 20 minutes, can we pray like desperate people? I want to move in powers that have not been seen. I want to move in dimensions that are lost from the face of the earth. if you can. Listen to me. I said to the church earlier when the writer of Hebrews wrote to us in Hebrews 4.2 Stephen, he said the word that was preached to them was preached to us. He said, however, the word that was beneficial to us was not beneficial to them. He said the reason is this they did not mix it with faith. It means that any time the word of God comes, men have a responsibility to the word. What men decide to do with the word would determine the benefit they get. Listen, this word has stirred me up to believe God for more. One of the things that this word has come to tell me today is that I'm not even believing God for enough. Listen to what I'm telling you. Listen to what I'm telling you. It's telling me that I'm not believing God for enough. Are you here? Are you here? And, and I want us to enter into a place of prayer. We will not sing. Because sometimes people hide under the music. We need to labor in prayer until something is formed in us. I, are you here? Are you here? We need to labor in prayer until something is formed in us. He said, would the nation be born in the day? We are going to labor until these realities does not just become a sermon. It becomes a reality. Do you understand? I don't want to preach this sermon to my sons. I want my sons to see me live this sermon. So that as they see me leave this sermon, they will recognize that this is possible. So I want us to jump into an intense place of prayer. And, and listen, and listen, and listen. The, the, the place I want us to dwell on is that subject of consecration. Are you here with me? No, 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 no. The, the place I want us to enter in is that subject of consecration. I recognize, listen, listen. Paul said to the church of Corinth, he said one thing that I do, he said I beat my body. He didn't say God does it for me. He said I beat my body and I bring it under subjection. Do you understand? Joshua the chapter number 3, verse number 5. Joshua said to the congregation of Israel, consecrate yourself today for tomorrow that he didn't say the Lord is coming to consecrate us it means that the subject of consecration has to do with a man's mind and his will it means I can choose to sleep with a woman or not 
I can choose to go into a place of prayer or not. There are things that we want God to come and do it for us. The Lord says it begins with you. Paul said, I beat my body. The word of God says in the book of Nehemiah, the chapter number four, that the men of Nehemiah were able to rebuild the walls in 52 days. Not because they were strong. He said because they had the mind. It means that they possessed a certain mental fortitude that permitted these men to build wall around Jerusalem in 52 days. I want God. And there are three things Apostle said. He said, number one, the assurance of God. Number two, you're thinking. Number three, you're talking. He said, these three things would bring you into a place where everything that you want to see shall be seen. The assurance is there. It is in his word. What the battle is, is our thinking, which will not translate into our talking. The battle is in the mind. We want to pray, but there is a weakness in the mindset that says you can't. You want to, you know, reach out. There is a weakness that says you can't. We want to tell the Lord, Lord, give us that grace to have this mental fortitude. There are some people here who have received this word. The moment they leave this building, all of a sudden, the enemy will just trouble their waters. And all of a sudden, the faith in them would be missing because the mental fortitude was not there. The Bible says this concerning of Jesus, that in all the beatings, the God did not give up his ghost until everything that was written concerning him that was fulfilled. Now then he said, it is finished. And he gave up his spirit. The man. When I used to be back home, we used to cut, we used to kill live chicken. Esty, sometimes when you cut the head of the chicken and you remove the feathers and you are pouring water on the chicken, the chicken is still breathing and walking. Because even though the head is off, there is something in the consciousness of the chicken that says that I am not dead yet. I, 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 I listened to Dr. Mensah Otabo one day and he said, cartoons, God will do more with cartoons than human beings. Because he said when he watches cartoons, sometimes their head can be cut off and they'll go back and take their head and put it on and keep running. It's here. It's here. It's here. I want us to jump into this realm of prayer. Number one, Father, give me that discipline. He said self-control and self-restraint. I beat my body. Look, look, there is something about this sermon. I will share it in the chambers with my sons. On the 31st night, the Lord sent a prophet to me. He said, the Lord said I should tell you that he's going to give you this because of this. I can't share. I will share it to my sons in the secret place. I'm telling you, this thing that the man is talking about was self-control and self-restraint. It is the very thing that has undone great men. And it is the very thing that has stopped men from becoming great. Paul said, I beat my body. I subject it. I keep it in restraint. We want to lift up our voice right now. And say, Lord, give me the ability. Now, let, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. The moment the mind moves forward, the Holy Ghost takes control. For he worketh in us both to will and to do. You see, the Holy Spirit wants us to make the move so that he would be our helper. If there is no agenda on our behalf, he ceases to become a helper. If you decide to beat your body, he comes as your help. Lift up your hand right now. My God, my God. Say Holy Ghost. I'm not hearing you. Say Holy Ghost. Say Holy Ghost. Tonight. Say Holy Ghost. Tonight. I make. I make. A decision. To go. On a journey. Of consecration. Say Spirit of the living God. When I lift up my voice. In the place of prayer. In the place of prayer, in the place of prayer, give me the power, the ability, the capacity, the capability to restrain my body, to restrain my soul, to restrain my spirit, to restrain my feelings. Makatalaba, lift up your voice. Pray. Help 
said the Lord. He said, I will. It means that there is a place, there's a borderline where God and the devil both stand and see what men will do with will. There 
is a place where God does not intervene. The devil does not intervene. The Holy Ghost does not even intervene. They look at what man will do with their will. Joseph didn't say, I would go and pray. He said, I will not do such a thing. But you see, you have to be a man who has highly consecrated yourself. If you study the patterns of our time, great men, great men that we saw on TV, that we admired, that we loved, that wrought in signs and wonders. If you study the patterns of our time, all of a sudden something would happen. Then somebody will come. Then someone will say this. My, grandfather, my grandmother said this to me before she died. She said, Randolph, let them accuse you but always make sure the accusation is false. Make sure it is false. Make sure that if a woman comes and say, he touched me, make sure it is false. Because the, the testimony of Potiphar's wife against Joseph was a false one. He said, he came to lie with me. It was a false one. But Joseph in his mastery said, I will not. There are certain people on the horizon. The enemy will not test them with a woman or a man. The enemy will bring money. And that is the place where, you know, that would be the borderline of their next level. But because they are not highly consecrated, because they have not died enough, because they have not gotten into the realm where they can say, I've beat my body and put it under subjection. What God is doing in this meeting is this. He wants to first do a work in us before he does a work with us. Do you understand? A work in us first. He called them to come and be with him so that he might send them. The, send, the first thing God wants to do is if this message did not stir you up to consecration, there's a problem. There's a problem. As the angel of the Lord put tongues in the coal of fire and placed it upon the tongues of Isaiah and said, Today I have taken off your iniquity. We want to pray. Let God touch us in a way. Oh, you are not here. You are not here. Let the Holy Ghost touch us in a way. Are you here? Let the Holy Ghost in this meeting visit us in a way that by the time we leave, our iniquity has been taken. Our weakness has been taken. Our failures have been taken. May we leave this place as men that are contrast and overcome it. Lift up your hands. Say Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Rebecca Payabaha, Rebecca Payabaha, Emma Kundaba, Emma Kolabaha. Say Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, say Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Touch me in a way, touch me, touch me deeply, touch me deeply. until my iniquity, until my iniquity is taken. Say Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, touch me right now, touch me right now. with cause of fire, with cause of, with fire. Cause of fire. With cause Say fire. burn in me, burn in me, burn my weakness, burn my feelings, burn my shortcomings, burn in me. Lift up your voice and
Listen to me. A generation is one of the most gifted. We don't lack where we don't lack revelation. The difference between us and the fathers is not how gifted we are. The difference between us and the fathers is how surrendered and dead we are. And Bishop Oedipo says he would just pick up the book of Acts and he would just go on a fast for 24 days just to read Acts. John the Baptist, even though he is a Levite and the son of Zechariah, and he's supposed to be raised in the mission house, the Bible says that he would, you know, he would he would forsake all of these benefits and be in the wilderness until the time of his show. To the extent that when John, when the Baptist comes out, he's almost an embarrassment because priests by then they have their cassock, they have their cloak, they have their garment. But John the Baptist comes and 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 what he's wearing, how he sounds is different. Yet the Bible says that this man will stand, and everybody, um, to the point that men even believed that he was the Messiah. It was not because the man was more spoken. He was highly consecrated above the men of his time. If not, the Lord will not require him to be the one who baptizes. How can you be the one cleansing men if you carry iniquity? So it's not that we are not gifted. We are extremely gifted, but the enemy knows. Give him two years, a woman will flow him. The enemy knows, bring him 10 million dollars, you change his testimony. We are not dead enough. I'm telling you, we are not dead enough. But there's a place where when we get and we die more, we 
we surrender more. We, we, we stay consecrated more. All of a sudden, there will be sense to our messages. I want to lift up this prayer and I'll lift up one final one and we are, and we are gone. That Father, give me the capacity to go beyond myself. Oh. Look, 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 look. There's a realm you get to. The Lord takes you on a momentum. That's why he said, though that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. He said they shall mount up with wings. There's almost a place in the journey that God gives you wings. You mount up. It is almost as if help comes to you. And that is what I want us to pray about. Father, give us that grace. Give us the grace you gave to the fathers. Give us the discipline you gave to the fathers. Give us that death you gave to the fathers. Bring us. Paul says that, he said that, you know, we, we proclaim his death so that his life may be revealed in us. Are we here? We want to lift up our voice and pray and say, Father, give us that discipline of the Father. Give us that, help me to go beyond myself. If I think I can only fast for five days, help me to go beyond. If I think that my weakness is a woman, help me to go beyond. If I think my weakness is money, help me to go beyond. I don't know who I'm talking to, but help me to go beyond. Lift up your voice and begin to help me to go some angels to touch certain people and I hear the Lord say he's burning away their weakness lift up your hands right now and close your eyes my God there are angels of help and they are they are here to exchange the weakness of men for the strength of God say Holy Ghost Say Holy Ghost. Touch me right now. Touch me right now. 
ushers, just watch out. God will just touch some few people right now. Yeah. God will touch some people right now. He's literally, he's literally just touching men right now by the count of three. One, two, three. Yes, yes, yes. He's touching them right now. He's touching them right now. Right now, touch her right now, touch right now, touch right now, touch right now in the name of Jesus. Now lift up your hands finally. Tara, we will not fail God. Feel God. God is look. <laughs> Don't see a lift up your hand. Don't see a lift up your hand. Don't see a lift up your hand. God is touching people right now. One, two, three. <laughs> right now, right now, right now. Lift up your hand. This is my final prayer. Apostle Mike, as you were speaking, there's only one thing the Holy Spirit was telling me. He said, when men have conquered this flesh, he said, they must come into a realm of knowing. The man said, you must know the love of God. He didn't say you must feel. He said, the moment you recognize that God loves you, there is no extent you can go for God. The moment you know that there are certain realms that are obtainable, he said, Philip did not get to Samaria because he was anointed. He said he was not, you know, teleported because he was anointed. He knew something we did not know. As he was speaking, I said, Lord, bring me into the realm of this knowing. For those who those who know their God, that realm is a realm of awareness. When the Ethiopian eunuch had awareness of Isaiah fifty three, when Philip brought him into the realm of knowing, Philip didn't say said a sinner's prayer. The Ethiopian eunuch, when he got by the river, he said, "What stops me?" from being baptized. Philip did not preach a message of baptism, but the guy knew, I cannot return to Ethiopia without baptism. If you can know, you can obtain. Do you hear, do you hear what I'm saying? This is our final prayer, and this is it. Lord, bring me in this realm of knowing. Because you see, watch this. Knowing always produces. Are you here? In Genesis 4, he said, and Abraham knew, and Adam knew his wife. That was carnally. But it is also a statement of the spirit. And Adam knew his wife, and they begat. So it means that the moment I come into that realm of knowing, I will birth something. What I have not birthed is because of what I don't know. I have not yet become because I don't know. The moment I know and you go to the fifth level you spoke about, you are willing to sacrifice. But you must know something to sacrifice. In the book of Revelation, the chapter number five, he said, worthy is the lamb who was slain to obtain riches and power and wisdom and glory. Jesus, for the sake of the joy that was set ahead of him, Hebrews chapter number 12. The Bible says he endured the cross and he despised the shame. The reason why he endured is because of what he knew he could obtain. He said for the joy of that which was set ahead of him, he endured the cross. Knowing. Knowing. When you know going to church seven times a week, praying 12 hours every day, 
will not become a burden because you know that you are there is something that is obtainable men may not understand because they don't know what you know lift up your hand this is going to be a prayer father bring us into the realm of knowing what did Abraham know that when Isaac asked him father we have the fire and we have the sticks but where is that ram or lamb what did Abraham know when he said the Lord will provide and when he got there the Lord had provided what did he know men will criticize us because they don't know what we know men will criticize us because you don't know they don't know what we know but father bring us into this place of knowing that I may know him that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering that I may be conformed to his death that I may know watch this the Holy Ghost just asked me a question he said son are they willing to pay the sacrifice to know the Holy Ghost just told me right now because you see I love what Apostle Mike said he said even the people of the dark kingdom they understand consecration he knows if he gives away his mother he'll be given a city he know if he kills his firstborn, he will be given a territory. Are we here? We, we want to tell God, Lord, give us the grace to pay the price to bring us into that realm of knowing. I want to know God. I want to know him. I want to know this place. I want to know this realm. I want to have access to knowledge. I want to know. I want to come into that place of awareness. Lift up your hands and say, Holy Ghost. bring me into this realm of knowing come on lift up your voice and pray that's my final
angels of the Lord are working in our midst right now. <laughs> they are purging the hearts of men. They are purging the hearts of men. They are purging the hearts of men. He's doing a deep work in us. get home, keep at it. For some of you, something will break out of you. The Bible said, they that believe out of their bellies shall flow rivers of living waters. But for those rivers to flow, it must be overflooded. That's the purpose of this stirring. It keeps stirring. And as it bubbling and bubbling, pepper, bubbling and bubbling, it will overflow the banks. That's when the nations will drink from you. Some of us have come to water a generation. Some of us have come to water a nation. As you keep yourself stirred, something will bubble out of you that will quench the taste of your generation. Tomorrow, we will continue. There's so much depth. But time sometimes is a limitation. It's a body. We trust God for grace to go even deeper tomorrow. Um, I have an instruction. Tomorrow and next tomorrow, take a sacrifice. Come and drop it on the altar. I'm not leaving the UK with a dime. So, so I don't need an radio. I did come. But there is a new level of operation for you. And so there are consecrations. I didn't have time to teach on the stewardship consecration. I'm going to show you financial consecration and the implication. We just touched the prayer aspect. Tomorrow I will touch another one. And then I will also touch that of finances. Take a sacrifice. Drop it. Next tomorrow, if you don't have tomorrow, next tomorrow, drop it. I will pray for you. Your life will prove what we are sharing to be true. Your life will prove it. Before we break, I just want to call God's servant. Just one minute to speak a word of blessing. Can we receive Pastor Kofi all the way from Canada to speak a word over God's people? Jesus, we love you. Can we honor the men of 
God that have just gone before us. As the man of God was ministering, I saw a deep well. The Lord said that he's bringing this commission into a season of stirring. The Lord said that as we stir ourselves up, that we'll have experiences and encounters like we've never seen before. So Father, right now we speak in the name of Jesus over the sound of my voice from the front to the back from the side of the left to the right father this stirring that i saw in the spirit father god let this stirring not depart from our fabric come on just stir yourself some just some 30 seconds just pray in the hall just stir yourself i saw a stirring Zantos kivis kava. Lomos kapaya. Let it break out from within us. 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 There is a stirring in the spirit. Lord, let it break out. Let it break out from within us tonight. Let it break out. Let it break. Oh, it's breaking now. There's 10 people in this place. It's breaking out of you now like a river. It's flowing right now like a river. One, two, three, four, five. Let that river break out. There it is. Watch. Watch. Pascoposka Aya. Oh, Rapaska. It's a river. Oh, my God. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, take it. Take it. Take it. Take it, take it like a river. Take it. Let it flow. Let it flow. Let it flow. Let it flow. Let it flow, let it flow, like a river, like a river, like a river, like a river, let it flow like a river, bra. let it flow like a river, river tokos kappa, let there's five more people, from my left to my right, one, two, three, four, five, now take it, take it, take it, Take it like a river, Palia. Kaparos kepe us. Oh, 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 oh. Let it all scapay. Parobos. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. There are three people on my left. It's coming right now. Take it. That is. There it is. That's one. Where is the second person? Paskapari Alaba. Two, that's two. There is one more person at the back. Take that fire. Take that stirring. For new dimensions in the spirit of Pakaska. Let that stirring, that stirring, that stirring in the spirit. Deep wells. Deep wells, deep wells, the stirring, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Kapali Alalabas Kapa.
so let this stirring that has started as the man of God said continue to flow like a river ministry mantles are going to be released as you stir apostolic dimensions of favor will be released as you stir prophetic mantles for nations will be released as you stir thus says the word of the Lord this is the days these are the days of the stirring these are the days of the stirring where men will be raised to go to the four nations, the four corners of this earth these are the days of the stirring where God will open up the eyes of those to see in the realm of the spirit that God will raise men who will consecrate themselves to see a nation be born these are the days of the stirring in Jesus name help me welcome if you were blessed by this message you just listened to and you wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior kindly repeat the prayer after me dear Heavenly Father I believe in your son Jesus Christ and that he died for my sins. He was raised from the dead for my justification. I, therefore, confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just said these prayers, congratulations. You are now a member of the family of God. Kindly send us an email, prayer at EncounterJesusMinistriesInternational.org. You can also visit our website at www.EncounterJesusMinistriesInternational.org.